Welcome to another video from explainingcomputers.com. This time I'm going to take this temperature, pressure and humidity sensor and use it to turn a Raspberry Pi into a weather station. So let's go and get started. Right, let's take a closer look at our sensor hardware, which is based on a Bosch BME280, which is mounted on a breakout board from Pi Maroni, and this sells for £12.60. So, if we ask Mr. Scissors to come in and snip the top of the packaging across like that, I think that'll let us in like that. And in theory, we can now open up our little bag. Hopefully, I got this right. Yes, we have, and we can take out what we have here, which is the sensor and two five pin headers. And if we just turn the sensor around, you can see the actual BME280 component that provides temperature, pressure and humidity sensing is the rounded metal box with a hole in it, which is only about 2.5 millimeters square. So it really is very tiny indeed. If we look at the board's web page here on the Pimeroni website, you can see they don't just sell the module, they also support it well, which is always great to see. There's various links down here. So for example, there's a Python library available for the board. So we know we've got the libraries available to get data from the sensor. That's clearly very significant. And there's also some sample code. They label it here, a few nice little examples, which is again, great to see, takes us across to GitHub. We'll have a look at some of this sample code in the next segment of the video. And there's also a link here to the data sheet for the module from Bosch. So we can learn all about the BME 280. I find it fantastic with this wonderful data sheet for this tiny little module. Always great to see things like that. I like this type of stuff, as you probably gathered. And if we go down here, you can see the target devices for using this sensor are shown there for us. Let's zoom in a bit on that, which includes mobile phones and tablets and navigation systems and cameras and flying toys and watches, and also home weather stations, which is what we're using the sensor for here. It's worth noting that a BME280 sensor is also available in a slightly different module from Adafruit for $14.95, as you can see. So the wiring will be slightly different to what I'm gonna show you here, because it's a different configuration of module, but the implementation and operation of the project will be exactly the same using this Adafruit component. Talking of wiring, I'm going to solder the supplied female right angle header directly onto the sensor board, which will allow us to attach it straight onto a Raspberry Pi's GPIO pins 1, 3, 5, 7 and 9, with the sensor positioned away from the heat generated by the system on a chip. But alternatively, we could solder some jumper leads onto the module, some leads like these, and indeed we could use leads like these to extend the sensor away from the Pi if we need to do that in the future. So, I'll get on with some soldering, which is always a great thing to try and show you on camera, but here we are, it seems to be working reasonably well anyway, and with it complete, we can now mount the sensor onto a Raspberry Pi. And here, I've chosen a Raspberry Pi 3 Model B+, Plus, which remains an absolutely classic piece of hardware, a really nice Pi, but any model of Raspberry Pi can be used for this weather station project. Right, I've now got the Pi all connected up and running, and here in Raspberry Pi OS, there's a couple of things we need to do to allow us to access the BME280 module. And the first of these is to enable the I2C serial communications interface. And we can do this by going to the uh, menu here, go to preferences, we'll do it graphically via Raspberry Pi configuration. And if it comes up, there we are. We go to interfaces, I2C is there, we will enable that and click on OK. Secondly, we need to go to a terminal, which I've already opened up here, and I've put in the command we need. What this command does is to install a couple of libraries, specifically the Pimeroni BME280 module library, and also a library called smbus. And if you're looking at this code and thinking what's going on, it's doing a super user do to execute and install. It's also got a pip in here, and pip is a package management system for installing Python software. So that's why we've got sudo pip install rather than just sudo install. Anyway, that's what we need to enter, so we'll just execute that and hopefully things will happen. And there we are, that's all uh, installed, which is uh, pretty good. And so now we can go to some sample code to try everything out. So I'll uh, 
close this down and I've got opened up the Genie Programmers Editor here. And here is the first piece of sample code provided by Pi Moroni called All Values Pi. And what we can see here, basically it imports some libraries. It imports the time library. It then imports some functions from SMBus and from the BME280 library as well. You can see it sort of hedges its bets here. It obviously doesn't know which version of SMBus we might have. So it looks for one or two different versions of a, that particular module it needs. And then it prints out what it's doing. And then it goes down here to, as you can see, to initialize the sensor with that code there. Executes a while loop, which is going to go on forever. It's while true. True is always true. So this loop will go on indefinitely until we crash out of the program. And it's going to get values for temperature, pressure, and humidity by using a get command on the BME280. And it's going to print them out with a bit of formatting in terms of the decimal places. So this is very exciting. I've not tried this already. Sometimes I try things in advance in a video. I've not tried them here. So let's run this code and see what happens. And there we are, we're reading data from our sensor. Although it seems to be a bit strange, the first line of data looks about right, certainly in terms of the temperature in this room. And then after the first reading, everything seems to have gone a bit askew there. Not quite sure what is going on, but we are at least gathering data from the sensor. It looks like things can work. So I think this gives us a good foundation for the rest of the project. Right. Here I am back again. It's now the next day. I've been doing some experimentation and also writing a slightly different version of the code. And for a start, I've decided to tidy up the importing of libraries at the start of a code. You might remember it did look like this, where it checked to see whether it would use SMBus or SMBus2 from the SMBus library. I've discovered it's always SMBus it's using, so I thought we might as well tidy things up. That just kept me rather happy having some slightly neater code. I've also discovered that the first reading you get from the sensor is always wrong. So what I'm doing here is getting some data from the sensor, waiting for a second, ignoring that entirely, and then getting on with reading some actual data. But when we do that, let's run it up again, we still have issues. As yesterday here, we've got our temperature, our pressure and humidity. And the uh, pressure here looks to be about right. I've checked that against a weather site I found in Nottingham, which suggests it should be about a 999, or it is at the location they're testing. So the facts we're reading here are 995. That suggests that's pretty good. They suggest that the value for humidity is about 99%. It's raining most of the time in Nottingham today. That's very different to what we're measuring here. But here we're measuring at the moment internal humidity in a room that's uh, warmed up in the winter, so you get much, much lower humidity. Over here, this is a problem though. This is a temperature of 30.85 degrees, something like that in this room. That's not true. This room, according to a thermometer, is about 21 degrees. So this figure is way off. And the reason for that I've worked out and also read about is, if you think about it rather obvious, it's because the sensor is plugged onto the Raspberry Pi and it's separated from the system on a chip, but not by that much. And the Pi system on the chip is currently here running at, what, 48 degrees, and it therefore warms the air below the sensor and there's some conduction of heat around the board and up the GPIO pins, which also warms the sensor. Now, there's two things we could do about this. There's various stuff you can find online, which actually is, is dealing with the issue using code. Here are the Pimeroni bits of sample code. There's one here called compensated temperature, which builds on a review over here, which is of the Enviro hat, which uses the same sensor, another board from Pimeroni, a bit more sophisticated board. And this basically deals with the issue by taking the pi's temperature and using a scale factor and working out what the actual temperature of the world around the center actually is. We could do that, but to be honest, I think that's rather a daft method because you're never going to get the actual best temperature. And so what I'm going to do is this. Yes, as you can see, we've now got the sensor on a jumper lead separated out from GPIO connectors here. So the system on a chip generating its warmth can't influence the sensor, warm it up and give us incorrect readings. And indeed, if we look back to the Raspberry Pi's desktop and run the code, we see accurate results for temperature now reflects the temperature on the thermometer in this room. And the humidity results reflect what you'd normally expect to see in an inside room in the winter. Clearly that's gone up significantly because we don't have now the system on a chip drying the air around the sensor. Now, so far we've been executing the code here in the Genie editor, but it would be good if we could execute it in a terminal and also do so remotely. 
So we'll close down Genie and we'll open up a terminal and we'll do a list ls there to see where we are and we'll change to a Python code where I'll keep my Python code as you would guess. And the file we've been working on most recently is this one, bme280cjbaa. So to make that executable, I'll do a ch mod and a plus x and the file name, which is a bme280. And just because some of you want me to do so, I'll press the tab key to complete rather than typing the whole lot and press enter, and that will have taken place. And if we now do a list again, you will see it's now in green, so it's an executable file. And to check it works, we'll uh, do uh, that and we'll type again the file name BME and autocomplete and enter. And hopefully, yes, it's running. We've once again got our temperature, pressure and uh, humidity readings. So with that working, we'll stop this with a control C and we'll close down the terminal and we'll now set up the Pi to be accessed remotely. So to do this, we'll go to uh, preferences and Pi configuration. And first of all, we're going to turn on something called SSH, a means of accessing the Pi over a network, which is down here. So we'll enable SSH and OK. There we are. And because we've enabled SSH, we should really change the Pi's default password, which at the moment will be Raspberry based on the username Pi. So we go in here and we go to a change password. If you don't change your password after you've turned on SSH, you'll get lots of messages telling you to do so. So you might as well do it anyway. And I'm now going to shut down the Raspberry Pi and take it outside and put it in my garage or my garage, depending on how you want to pronounce it. And as you can see, it's now running headlessly. It's just connected to a power supply. And so if we go across to my laptop, instantaneously I'm now back indoors where it's much warmer. And here I've installed a small piece of software called Putty, which is an SSH client, which you can obtain for free from the address I'm showing you on the screen. So if we launch Putty, there we are. We enter the host name Raspberry Pi like that, which is the default host name for the Pi. It'll be that unless you've changed it. And if we click on open, there we are, it's come up. And just before I put my login details in, I'll quickly change the font setting so you can see things better on video. So we'll log in as a username Pi and the password I just entered when I changed the password, which was, I think that hopefully. There we are, we're now logged in. I'll do a clear just to make the screen nice and neat. And if we now do a list as before, we change to a Python code, just as we just did on the Pi itself. List there, we can see there's our file. We should be able to execute it with a, a BME. Can we autocomplete here? We can, and enter on that. And is it gonna run? It is, and as you can see, it's a bit colder outside, isn't it? And uh, seems to be dropping, presumably the sensor is acclimatizing to where it is, but it's now down to 11.8, 11.4, or 11.84. I can't read numbers. You can see what it is. It's clearly colder outside and the humidity is massively higher. So clearly we've now got to a point where we can have a Raspberry Pi remotely, potentially lots of Raspberry Pis remotely, reporting in their data on temperature and pressure and humidity. And from that, we could try to predict the weather. We could see if, for example, the pressure here, which is measured in a hectopascals, in case you were, you're wondering, if the pressure was falling rapidly, it means it's likely to rain or potentially snow if it's very cold over here. And generally, if the humidity is high and rising, it's also more likely to rain. Greetings. Here I am back again with a monitor, keyboard and mouse connected to the Pi, and we're now going to set things up to record weather data over time. And because we're working here in a full desktop operating system, we happen to have available a spreadsheet in the form of LibreOffice Calc. So if we launch up LibreOffice Calc, there we are. And what I've done is to create a spreadsheet, which I've got down here. I've been playing around with various spreadsheets. That's the final one and doesn't look very exciting at the moment. All it's got at the moment, as you can see, is five column headings for date, time, temperature, pressure, and humidity. So what we're going to do is to alter our code so it'll actually put our readings into the spreadsheet where we can look at them, manipulate them, chart them, whatever we wish to do. So let's close that down and go back to the Genie programming editor. There it is. And this is our new code. Let's go back to the top. You can see what's going on. 
And first of all, we're importing libraries, the ones we imported previously. But I'm also here importing date time and date time. I'm taking date from that as well, which we'll be using in a second. And I'm also importing a library called OpenPyXL. And this allows us to manipulate spreadsheets in Python. And to use this library, we first have to install it. And so earlier, I opened up a terminal and issued the command sudo pip install openpyxl, which ran through so we had the module on the system. Anyway, here we are back in the code, whereas previously we were initializing the sensor, taking a first reading and getting rid of it to overcome that first reading being rubbish issue. And then after that, we're loading in our spreadsheet, as you can see, and the spreadsheet is here, that's whether XLSX, sitting in home, pi, Python code, etc. And we're setting the sheet to be the first one in the workbook. We then get to our loop, which is sitting down here, where we're going to read the sensor as we did previously. Although here I'm rounding the values for temperature, pressure, and humidity when we first take them, rounding them to one decimal place, which makes life easier in the spreadsheet later on. And then we're also collecting the date as today and now, which is going to be the time. I thought we'd then let the user know what is going on. We're going to print out, we're adding this data to the spreadsheet, the date, the time, and uh, again, the uh, things we're actually reading, temperature, pressure, and humidity. And then we're going to append the data to the spreadsheet by setting up the row of data, which is going to be the date, time, temperature, pressure, and humidity, and we append it to the spreadsheet. We then save the spreadsheet, always important to keep saving your spreadsheet when you're adding data. And then after that, we're going to wait here for 10 minutes, which is 600 seconds. Finally, you might notice I've actually put the loop inside a try finally combination. And the reason for that is because we're gonna to have to break into this with control C, and we might break in before the spreadsheet's been saved. And so because of that, with a try finally thing set up, it means whatever happens, it'll execute what's listed on the finally, which here is to save the workbook, and of course, to print goodbye. So let's just test this out. And because testing doesn't wanna take forever, I'll change 600 seconds to say, uh, I don't know, three seconds just to show you what's going on. So I'll put that in there and we'll save this. And if we execute this code, fairly similar to what happened before, of course, but it's basically now tells us it's adding this data to the spreadsheet, date, time. This could be better formatted, but it's good enough for now. I mainly care about what's going into the worksheet. You can see it's adding the stuff in. Let's do a couple of others. Another one, that'll do. And I'll control C to get out of that. And we'll now go back to our spreadsheet and we'll uh, load it in. Very exciting, isn't it? And you will hopefully see, yes, there we are. The data's come into the spreadsheet. It's stored date, time, temperature, pressure, and humidity. And of course we can look at our data here. We could chart it if we wanted to. This is becoming quite a useful tool for monitoring and potentially predicting the weather. So now I'd like to try this out for real. So I'm going to select this data and get rid of it, select the rows and do a delete. Effectively reset our spreadsheet, we'll save that. And we'll come out of this, we'll go back to our code and change our time sleep back to uh, 600 for those 10 minute increments, file and uh, save. And I'm now going to shut down the Pi and return it to an outdoor location. Right, the Pi is now again out in the cold whilst I'm in the warm inside on my Windows laptop where I've logged into the Pi, navigated to the Python code directory, and you can see we need to run the code here which is a weatherspread.py. I didn't make that executable before, so I'm doing it now here remotely via SSH, which should be fine. There we are. Let's just list again and you'll see, yes, it's turned green. So uh, let's now execute that code with uh, that and uh, like that and execute. And we'll see, hopefully the Pi is going to be giving us some data in a second. There we are. It knows what time it is. Oh look, it's not very warm, is it? 6.4 degrees centigrade. Anyway, we now know that the next measurement won't be taken for 10 minutes. And so I'm now going to leave the Pi for a few hours to get on collecting data. And here I am back again, just over three and a half hours later. Data has been collected consistently, it seems, all this lovely data. And by the magic of filmmaking, we'll go across to a spreadsheet with the data in it. There are, of course, various ways this could happen. We could download the data from the Pi over the network. We could get Pi to save the data to a USB drive and take it off the Pi that way. 
Or we could boot up the Pi with a keyboard and monitor and mouse attached and launch LibreOffice Calc, which is what I've done here. And I do find this very interesting. This is real weather data, isn't it? What a weather station should be doing. It's allowing us to look at trends in data over time. And we can see that the temperature has dropped as it's got darker and colder across the afternoon. The pressure has been pretty consistent, but the humidity, the humidity is definitely increasing here. I think it's going to rain fairly soon. It's gone from, uh, what, 72 to 89% humidity. I think that suggests we're going to see some rain. But anyway, in terms of our experiment, this has clearly worked. We've managed to use the Pi to collect some real weather data. Well, there we are. We've delved into the use of a Raspberry Pi for monitoring and potentially predicting the weather. In a future video, I might try and go further and attempt to use a Raspberry Pi to actually control the weather, although I suspect we'll have to wait for the release of the Raspberry Pi 5 before we're able to do that. But now that's it for another video. If you've enjoyed what you've seen here, please press that like button. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe, and I hope to talk to you again very soon.